so this is a patient that actually uh, is presenting in an uh, unusual manner for us in the United States. This patient has uh, what we call de novo metastatic disease. And uh, for the past four years, obviously, a lot of changes have occurred in the management of these uh, men with advanced disease. I think perhaps the most important thing is how the patient works into the office. Uh, we now split patients by volume. Uh, and there, although there are many definitions for volume, uh, truly the definition of volume means uh, how many lesions you have or one has, and what is, uh, what are those lesions located? Uh, so he has what we call, based upon the American data, and for that matter, the French data, which is what we use to define volume of disease, he has high volume metastatic disease. You know, I think the, the complexity of deciding between chemo or uh, an oral agent in the context of de novo presentation uh, is controversial in the sense that there is no head-to-head -head data uh, thus far. Uh, so we have uh, pieces of data that would suggest that uh, both agents based upon his high volume disease could actually be applicable in this case. So we have the American data that look specifically at patients with uh, de novo metastatic disease, where we actually added docetaxel-based chemotherapy to the backbone of suppression of testosterone with ADT. And clearly that data demonstrated a significant survival improvement for men with high volume metastasis, almost a 40% risk reduction or mortality uh, for those men who receive chemotherapy in addition to suppression of testosterone. We also have the British data that actually supported that approach. Uh, and then uh, more recently, a couple of years ago, we had the French data, so-called latitude, that demonstrated that the addition of abiraterone acetate, which is an oral agent that is capable of blocking uh, specific enzymes within the adrenal gland, specifically CYP17, uh, uh, the CYP17 enzyme, and other enzymes such as 1720 uh, lyase and other hydroxylases, which are enzymes that allow uh, mediation of early androgen production in the adrenal gland. So the addition of abiraterone to ADT in that data also demonstrated a significant survival improvement, specifically for patients with high volume disease. So in my mind, if you define their volume, uh, the standard of care right now, at least in my mind in the United States, should be for high volume disease, then you get either suppression of testosterone plus docetaxel-based chemotherapy, six cycles, or you can consider giving suppression of testosterone plus abiraterone acetate on a continuous basis until either you progress or develop drug intolerance. I think the bigger question resides right now for patients who don't have high volume disease, for which chemotherapy is not the standard in my opinion. Uh, however, uh, the British also with a trial so-called Stampede have helped us pave uh, the treatment options for these patients. And in my mind, with the best data that we have, I do believe men with de novo, low volume disease should not be offered chemotherapy, but rather should be actually counseled to receive the addition of abiraterone on top of their suppression of testosterone. So I think the response is, uh, it depends how you define response, obviously, in the, uh, the way that I think of these agencies, what are the goals of the care for these patients? So the number one priority for me is looking at the data is a survival benefit. So I can tell a patient with de novo disease, if we're gonna put them on ABI in the context of high volume disease, that I can put them on ADT and abiraterone, I, and I can reduce the risk of mortality by almost 40%, which is the hazard ratio of uh, reduction of mortality, which is what we saw in that uh, latitude data. I can also tell the patients that the likelihood of serologic response, which is the ability of this treatment to lower their PSA, you know, is significant as well. You know, and we also know that the lowest the PSA, the better patients do. So the nadir PSA, which is what is the lowest PSA that you achieve on therapy within six months for that matter, and also at 12 months, is a very strong predictor of outcome for these patients. And lastly, another important topic of how one defines efficacy would be how long it will take my disease on treatment to progress. And that progression, again, is defined by a rising of your PSA despite of treatment, meaning despite of the lack of testosterone, or symptomatic progression or radiographic progression. So that is the time that it takes these men to develop castration-resistant prostate cancer. So I would argue survival, delaying progression, and uh, decreasing uh, serologically your PSA.